Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Gulf International Forum. My name is David DeRoche. I'm a non-resident fellow at the Gulf International Forum. I'm also a professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Security Studies uh, at the National Defense University. And I have to tell you that my remarks do not reflect the view of any U.S. government agency. Today, we're here to discuss a rather remarkable book that I think people will be talking about for some time, and we're honored to have the author here. The book is Security Politics in the Gulf Monarchies, and the uh, author is Dr. David Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts is a professor, or senior lecturer rather, uh, that ranks mean something in Britain, uh, at the um, uh, King's College London in the Department of Defense Studies. Uh, his daily teaching duties are uh, with the UK Armed Forces. He's been at the Royal College of Defense Studies and at the Armed Forces College at Shrivenham. Uh, prior to that, he was the director of the Royal United Services Institute office in Qatar, among other things. He's a, a well-known commentator on uh, issues related to uh, the Gulf and to Middle East security, as well as political philosophy and international relations. He's uh, been a uh, recurring lecturer and teacher at Sciences Po in Paris and uh, has been running programs uh, basically all over Europe. He's a well-known figure uh, in the field. He's, his previous book, Cutter, Securing the Global Ambitions of a Modern City-State, is uh, the go-to reference. And I think this book is, as I said earlier, going to join those. What's so interesting about this is, first off, it applies an approach uh, in international relations that Americans in particular are not used to. The um, so-called Copenhagen School, for those in international relations, which uh, broadens the definition of security in a way that perhaps at the time it was formulated was viewed as a little suspect. But now that we have reports uh, tracking the security effects of things like climate change uh, and projections that, for example, the U.S. Navy base at Norfolk will find itself submerged if, uh, if the seas continue to rise, uh, we find that this, this mode of thinking uh, has, has made its way into the mainstream. And as far as I can tell, Dr. Roberts's book is the first book-length treatment of security in the Gulf that examines it through these lenses of society, politics, economics, environment, as well as the military considerations. And it's particularly important for the Gulf because uh, as a, a broad body of scholars have said, um, uh, people in the Gulf tend to view security as solely a function of equipment and then to a lesser extent, the soldiers who man those, that equipment. Uh, and the other factors historically have been neglected both by practitioners as well as by scholars. Uh, so Dr. Roberts uh, is coming to us. We're going to be going for an hour. Uh, the, those of you who are watching on YouTube, you have a chat function there to enter questions, which I will field and pose to Dr. Roberts. Uh, but uh, First, let me give Dr. Roberts a few minutes uh, to discuss his book, the general tensions of it. Hopefully that will stimulate some discussion and then we'll go straight to the, uh, the questions. David, the floor is yours. Super, so um, thanks so much, Professor DeRoche for, for taking the time to be here and uh, to the Gulf International Forum more generally. You know, it's always a pleasure for, uh, for an author to have a, a chance to speak about their book. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very grateful. So. Let me just offer a couple of minutes thought, trying to sort of set the scene for the book and then try to talk a little bit about sort of what it's about uh, in essence. And so I feel that in Gulf studies more generally, this sort of a book has been a long time coming. Obviously we have a huge amount of super research going on these days. There are a lot of monographs coming out that are absolutely fascinating edited works as well, but I didn't, I don't really think that there's been a book that looks at all six Gulf monarchies at the same time in a particularly systematic way uh, in a very long time, to be honest. And I, so I thought that was an, it needed to be done, something of a gap in the market, if you will. I try to carefully situate the book in a sort of a contemporary history. So in many ways, you know, the subtitle of the book is Continuity and Mid-Change. And this speaks to almost the comparison that I try to bring out throughout the book, comparing the evolution of the monarchies in the past century or so to where we find ourselves today. So that's another key theme in the book as well. 
it's a very heavily footnoted so hopefully it'll be useful for scholars out there i've really tried to hoover up and build on the, so much of the good work out there in arabic and english as well and so i hope it's useful in that kind of a sense more generally the drive for this book at this moment is that you know we seem to be at such an interesting moment in the gulf so much is happening perhaps in a wider broader sense we could draw a, the cliched conclusion that you know it used to be cairo baghdad and damascus that temp set the temperature that set the direction of middle eastern affairs and i think it's probably fair to say that that sort of triangle if you will is increasingly moved towards the gulf and it's Abu Dhabi, it's Doha, Dubai, Riyadh in particular, these sort of city, city states in some ways that are driving affairs uh, in the Middle East and further afield. And therefore, I think we needed this look at these critically important states for, for what they mean for themselves and the wider regional and international picture. Um, I'll just offer a quick word or two explaining the, 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 the framework of it. And I promise this won't be a, 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 an hour long lecture on international relations theory. I just wanted a sort of a simple, straightforward way to structure my book. You know, if exactly as Professor Drosh is saying, you know, if we'd been talking, if I'd been writing this book 30 years ago or something like that, looking at the concept of security, it would have been almost certainly a military focused book. There might have been some high politics in there about the Cold War. But then with the end of the Cold War, the understanding of what security is really began to diversify. For some people, it diversified far too much, focusing on individual elements of security. Security could be anything you wanted it to be, if you, as the phrase used to be, if you called for security in that sense. And so between the very narrow focus of security on military matters and a impossibly broad potential array of security concerns. Indeed, we have the Copenhagen School that's emerged in recent decades, uh, very prominent, particularly in Europe, that breaks that down security into sort of five elements in particular. So there is a military element, certainly, but couched with a political, economic, societal, <clears throat> and environmental component as well. Excuse me. And so those are, you know, it's a very simple structure for the book in many ways. Uh, those are the central chapters. And then under each section, politics or military or whatever it may be, I sort of broadly break it into a couple more chapters and bring us from the contemporary sort of in the past 100 years up to the present day, as it were. Now, in terms of an, an argument, I mean, in some ways, I suppose I don't have one in the sense that I didn't go into writing this book with a bee in my bonnet. You know, I don't have some polemical thing I want to say, I feel needs to be said. And so I found myself after, you know, 80,000 words in, when I came to write my conclusion, uh, it was a little bit of trepidation in many ways, in the sense of, you know, what, what am I concluding here? Like going back to, like I said at the beginning, I really felt that we needed the book explaining all the sort of the more individual components of security if you will in the gulf but i suppose if there's one central animating theme throughout the book it is it's the it's the cliche theme about how critical the sort of the oil and gas but we'll call them hydrocarbon economies mm -hmm. have been in the gulf and that in this age where we are speaking you know so frequently about uh, diversification away from oil away from gas and these sorts of concerns you know the obvious conclusion is that this conversation is not uh, at all an economic conversation because the very nature of the contemporary gulf monarchies is so utterly and profoundly inextricably founded upon the oil and hydrocarbon economies more generally that if there is going to be a fundamental economic transition it definitionally affects the political elements economic of course societal environmental and the military components and so this is something of a master lens in many ways and you know there's nothing wildly new in that sort of component in that conclusion as it were but i think that trying to bring these things up to date uh, is, a, is a worthwhile endeavor perhaps lastly i'll just offer a couple of 
brief highlights from the from the different chapters, my my, my five chapters, uh, just just a quick sketch in many ways. So when I speak about the politics of the region, I'm speaking to broadly political security and political stability might be a better way to see it. And again, it's about change and continuity. So it's about the continuity in threats to the political elites and how those things have changed. And so the change in continuity here speaks to things like tribal concerns and the likes. Mm -hmm. They used to be significantly more present, of course, in several of the Gulf monarchies, whereas today we would not say that tribal politics is absent from the region, certainly not if we look to Qatar and particularly Kuwait maybe in recent years. But probably, you know, the, the political elites have the upper hand these days in dealing with these sorts of concerns. And so, again, there, is, there are these uh, links of continuity in many ways. Particularly what we've seen in recent years and where we've seen some fascinating scholarship emerge is when it comes to speaking about the creation of almost new nationalisms in the Gulf, a new kind of a rally around the flag mentality. And these are often quite securitized in many ways. Mm -hmm. This is to say that, you know, the leading elites uh, in the region want to forge, want to evolve, not exactly forge, but evolve the national understanding of what the state is. Uh, where allegiances lie, do they lie, you know, to those maybe of a tribal persuasion, those of a more Islamist persuasion, wherever it may be. And I think this is the answer, is this sort of Secular is not a good word for it, but there's, it's it's not focusing on those things. It's focusing on the state more generally, yeah. and the state and the meaning of the state as defined by the leaders themselves. We'll speak, I dare say, about the ebb and the flow, the continuity and the change of the U.S. role in the region, of the role of large foreign actors. That's obviously something of a, of a consistent discussion to be had, and things of. I think we're coming to a fascinating inflection point here, to be honest, um, when it comes to the influence of the US, growing influence of China and these sorts of issues. So that's broadly in the political kind of a basket. When it comes to economics, like I say, mostly we're speaking to, to do with the formation of the monarchies and the hydrocarbon industries that set everything up, really. And it's interesting that when you do go back 100 years or more, well, more, certainly more, in fact, in some of the smaller monarchies in particular, you reflect on the prevalence and the domination of the pearling industry. So what is the pearling industry but the emergence of a hyper-local industry created solely based on the fact of finding of finite, basically non-renewable resources that mandated huge amounts of migration into the region. You know, this economic driver just it, it, it shaped everything to do with particularly the proto-states on the eastern coast uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. And then, of course, pearling broadly disappeared in the blink of an eye. And while it's tempting, of course, to draw an analogy between pearling as this locally sourced non-renewable industry and oil or something like that, you know, I think that wouldn't be a, a reasonable kind of, um, it's not a useful analogy in that sense, because, of course, I think our, the oil paradigms will be, be with us for a lot longer and there's not going to be a day when the industry certainly uh, ultimately just runs out of juice. But there's an interesting sort of mm. change in continuity there which to do with the way an industry fundamentally in a truly deep way shaped city-states and shaped parts of the region. Societally speaking, we have a lot to say about migration. Again, migration initially driven by pearling industries and the likes. Um, migrants back in the day, a century ago, into the 50s, into the 1960s, <clears throat> they were the, uh, they trans transmitted ideas from elsewhere in the Gulf. Excuse me. So when we speak about, you know, these challenging ideas, sometimes they're described as sort of horizontally. So a challenging idea from one monarchy coming from other monarchies in the region or these more vertical, vertically challenging ideas where you get these ideas and competing modes of operandi, if you will, from elsewhere in the region. So maybe this is pan-Arabism coming in in the 50s, in the 60s, into the Gulf from Egypt, from Nasser as this challenging ideology. And so it's interesting we, that we have these 
the ebb and the flow and migration playing a role within that. More recently, of course, migration has become, in many ways, less, I need to be careful, I'm going to say less politicized. I mean, it's still a politicized issue, but the migrants themselves are sort of intrinsically less politicized themselves, I think. With the Qatar World Cup and the likes, particularly in Europe, we saw that issues surrounding migrants certainly remains hot button issues, but more or less the state have so far at least come to grips. They've found ways to control uh, migrant populations and denude them of any kind of political power, really. And indeed, local financial uh, economic elites are building into the monarchies the necessity in perpetuity for hundreds and millions of foreigners to be in the monarchies. This is you know, who is going to live in all of these residential apartment blocks and the likes. And so very interesting elements there. Yeah. Last couple of elements, just briefly. So when we speak about military components, we need to differentiate between the monarchies about what the role of the military is for in each and the likes. Um, I suppose in the interest of, of time to get back to our discussion, I would, I would probably say that at the moment, we are seeing more of this kind of mosaic approach to security emerging. Again, I imagine we might have a good discussion, Professor Darosh, about the role of the US, um, particularly in the military sphere, but elsewhere that how waning that is or not that's something interesting to be to, to reflect on and then internally the wider literature speaks a lot about coup proofing concerns and the likes which play a direct role a direct impact on as it were the utility and the effectiveness of gulf military forces and lastly but very much uh, not least we have the chapter on the environment um I guess all I'll say here, you know, I'm not telling anyone anything new here that the Gulf, the Arabian Peninsula more generally is feeling climate change more acutely in many ways than anywhere else, at least when it comes to the raw numbers, or at least it's, it's very much, very much up there. And so this is a significant issue for the region, which isn't really appreciated again going back to your, your early comments i think about what issues are perceived as being security issues and what are not now the last couple of things i'll say here and that you know the reason that we do not see great concern arguably on the arabian peninsula when it comes to environmental concerns is that you know down by the sides of the roads you have lush green grass palm trees uh, you can buy whatever you want in the supermarket water is free flowing and subsidies underpin all of this of course mm -hmm. as long as the gulf monarchies have the subsidies to pay to green the desert they can and they will uh, to pay to subsidize food imports they they can and they will as they have been doing for a very long time but this is how and why we are linked inextricably back to the economic paradigm in the region if you see what i mean and how and why economic transitions directly affect every facet of the region and um i've got plenty more to say needless to say but i might pass it back at the moment yeah. and, uh, well no that's that's that's, 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 wonderful. that's wonderful i mean wonderful. particularly highlighting the uh economic aspect of it or the environmental aspect of it rather uh you know there are other parts of the world that are um perhaps greater affected by climate change but uh, you have actually cities, <laughs> you know, you have people living mm -hmm. densely in, um, in a modern society. It's the only place where we have a significant number of people uh, living in what we consider to be the requirements of a modern state who are in an extremely fragile uh, environmental condition. So it's kind of a, a test bed. So um, going into it, and by the way, uh, let me once again, you know, reemphasize uh, the work here, which is will be of interest to both um, scholars of the region, as well as uh, it's a good introduction to the region. And uh, it's also useful um, for uh, sort of thinking about current state of international relations and how it applies to the real world rather than um, what we do at universities argue over the relative merits of one theory or another. It is, in fact, a, a scholarly work. There's over 90 pages of notes and uh, a bibliography, which I think would be you know, worthy of exploration on its own. It could be a standalone publication. Uh, and honestly, the the chapters are longish, thematically oriented chapters that each of which would be a good uh, term for uh, an undergraduate course. 
Uh, so, you know, if, if uh, that's what you're into, uh, the thing that the first thing that really jumped out at me that I'd like you to talk about is uh, when we go into the political section, uh, your book was oriented the same way that a visitor to the Gulf would do it. The first thing that you notice is the focus on external foreign labor, uh, which, you know, when you go to the Gulf, the first thing you see is, you know, only the policemen are from the Gulf when you pass through the airport. Everybody else is from someplace else. So what brought you to put that into the political section? You know, it, was, it was like the first issue of substance you discussed once you started getting into the analysis of the book. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, every time you have an organizing principle, so I've got my Copenhagen five mm -hmm. bucket approach, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, there are often issues that might fit into one or more. And you just need to make a, you know, a judgment ultimately. And again, when it comes to, you know, the definition of political security, which I took to be the concept of maintaining a certain stability, my not making a normative judgment that the nature of the, the, the monarchies in, 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 in the Gulf is the way it should be, but that's the way it has been. And so that's mm -hmm. what I'm looking at, the stability of the monarchical system in many ways with the families where they are. And, you know, when you go back a uh, hundred, go back in, in the books a hundred years or so, I mean, you are absolutely struck by the power and the influence of migration. I mean, mm -hmm. leaking a bit into the economic component. I mean, truly, when it comes to, you know, it might be Ajman, I can't remember, maybe a century ago where Perling was fully 100% of the economy or something like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you've got those sorts of numbers, you truly see the effect that migration had um, on the region uh, and particularly on the sort of the very early growing smaller statelets in, in many ways. And at the same time, you go back to the 30s, the 40s and so on. Migrants um, and their supporters in the region were bubbling. They were part of social discussion, discourse complaining, rioting, all these sorts of things. And the riots that, you know, um, usually economically rooted riots, as it were, people looking for better pay, better conditions and the likes, you know, they terrified the elites at the time. And it was mostly the Brits back then, of course, who were the broader international power supporting the elites. And the Brits were equally terrified of these migrant kind of uh riots yeah these these complaints in the streets at the very least and so it's you know a very obvious in many ways um i think a challenge to sort of societal stability in many ways and so i thought it had to go in in that section there and like i mentioned in my little introduction you know the role of migrants changed subsequently um, but it took a long time into the 70s, maybe into the 80s for them to become for the state apparatus to get, as, a, as, a, as the elites might put it, to get to grips, as they would see it with, the, with these problematic groups. But it took a long time uh, and it was a significant part of, of, uh, of the region, not covered as much as you might imagine. But again, you know, as you sort of kindly alluded to, I've really tried to just absolutely soak this book in the literature trying to hoover up yeah. all of the wonderful scholars uh, and their ideas. And this is a nice, interesting furrow that's kind of emerged, particularly in recent years, about protest in the Gulf. And there's a migrant link there. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I may just briefly take a small tangent, it's not only migrants that are involved, of course it's not, I guess, mm -hmm. in these local discussions and the establishment of um, Saut al-Bahrain and these sorts of local magazines. You have these local intelligentsia, who, you know, the Gulf was a feisty place that you might you might not have expected it to be a century ago uh, around then, with lots of discussion and demands about societal, political issues. You know, it was it was alive back then, and it's fascinating to discover these things, I think, and get them back out into into the into the wider narrative, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's um just just looking at that, you know, in the sixties you have the um, the Nasserism movement, and of course, that coincides with the influx of Egyptian teachers and intelligentsia, uh, and you know, when it, it 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 just goes on and on. I mean, even in the blockade, you know, the idea that Muslim Brotherhood is permeated, you know, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, things like that. So it's, I think, it's a great way to start. And uh, uh, once again, uh, uh, kudos for the overall holistic focus of security, which. 
Um, I know that all of the, the, the natural lines of drift in the region are to push towards military equipment, military mm -hmm. equipment. So this is great. We have a question from the field asks if, um, do we think the Gulf countries will model themselves after the Chinese approach to autocratic development, what I call techno authoritarianism? Um, and does this, this differ in the period when the Gulf states felt the pressure from Western allies to democratize? So it's, it's kind of two questions. One's on the role of China. The other one's kind of on the, um, have the Westerners, have the Western partners given up on trying to focus on reform? Uh, have we moved to working it or have we just been supplanted by this Chinese model where mm -hmm. you can be rich and influential without any real political reform? It's, it's a great question. Uh, if I omit an answer to one part, please come back to me. I've got a terrible memory. Well, no, not at all, but you have to specify which chapter in the book you think would address uh, this part better as you go on, just to guide the reader. Oh, goodness. Uh, I'll give and, it a quick flick through the rope book once again. as we go. Um, so looking back a little bit, setting this in, in, in a little bit of history, I suppose, with the end of the Cold War, you know, uh, 1990, uh, 1991 and all that, uh, the West had won. It, it appeared as if, if you wanted successful a state that functioned, if you wanted technological development, economic growth, there was only one game in town. The end of history, as it was infamously called at the time. And so this is maybe part of the reason why in the 1990s, what we saw, among other things, we saw lots of incremental moves towards low-level democratization in the Gulf. Mm -hmm the instantiation of new constitutions, uh, slight uh, expansion of enfranchisement, these sorts of things. Why? Because this is what the Gulf monarch monarchs kind of felt they had to do uh, in many ways. Partly they wanted grudgingly to do it because it was the only game in town economically development wise. And of course the US led dominate, um, uh, actions, Operation Desert Storm, uh, mm -hmm. Desert Shield and then Desert Storm, you know, again, that was just the encapsulation of the zenith of the Western power at the time. You know, it truly seemed like, you know, um, uh, Uncle Sam was beyond preeminent. And so these twin kind of pressures pushed the Gulf monarchies into this uncomfortable democratization question. <clears throat> they wrestled with that for decades, in essence, begrudgingly offering a little bit of democratic movement here or there but obviously not very much overall. Of course, Kuwait is the most democratic comparatively in the region. Um, we can come specifically onto Kuwait if you wish, but elsewhere in the region, we still don't have any kind of meaningful democracy, don't misunderstand me, but these sort of incremental uh, moves sort of took place. What we've seen coming onto this question more specifically, what we've seen in the past, I do not know, five, 10 years or so, very much uh, more, re and, and stronger and stronger every year is we have the growth of China and China has shown in many ways, <clears throat> excuse me, so I'm getting over nursery bugs here. <clears throat> China has shown in many ways that you can have absolute authoritarian control and rip roaring economic success. And not only can your economy be growing at a fast lick, but you can have world leading technology companies like Huawei or whatever it may be. And so with the emergence of China for the first time since the, the Cold War in many ways, and, and even during the Cold War, the Soviet Union wasn't really very popular at all, maybe a little bit in Kuwait, uh, but not much elsewhere. But what you have now is this other offer on the table uh, of <clears throat> no pressure for democracy at all, uh, and it's controlled authoritarian, state-driven, autocratic development. And that's broadly very attractive uh, around the Gulf, I think, who, where the monarchs don't want, quite clearly, I think, full democracy. Mm -hmm. um, they want to retain some kind of control, but they obviously want the development that China can bring. And so, yes, the Chinese model is extremely tempting. And it's this is the, the the wider point about the international arena at the moment with Uncle Sam. And we might come on to speak about Abcake uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. But I more broadly, I do see the, the, the levers that Uncle Sam has uh, 
as becoming less and less influential, if that's the right kind of phrase. Um, if they can't get a particular piece of equipment from Uncle Sam, if you're not going to sell them armed drones, no problem. We'll get some wing loon drones from China, whatever it may be on sort of piecemeal things like that. <clears throat> and a broader, we've seen it with Ukraine and Russia these days, a broader reticence to, well, of course, our, our, our friends in the Gulf did, you know, they, they hedged their bets uh, uh, is, the, is the kindest way to put it. By far uh, less than a full-throated support of Ukraine, but they hedge their bets with Russia, precisely because they feel they can, because they have the support in many ways, implicit and explicit, of China. And so I speak to these issues in the concluding remarks of the military chapter and the political chapter in particular. And so yeah, there are another mode, another modus operandi, another option on the table, and the Gulf monarchies are quite clear to sort of play both sides off the other. And the last thing I'll say here is that. There was an article in Bloomberg a, a week or so ago about how sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf were increasingly looking to China. They were thinking they were over leveraged in European capitals or the West more generally, and they were moving, looking to move more capital to China. And, my, and this would speak to this broader shift that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. We have been seeing and we've certainly been reading about exactly those sorts of trends for a Decades. very long time. And yeah. so... You know, as much as there is this Chinese alternative, there is this, you know, forlorn love lost relationship with between, I think, Western states and the Gulf monarchies. They are so <clears throat> comfortable and irritated by London and Washington and Paris at the same time that there are a lot of soft links there that I think will take a very long time to go. And so I don't think there's any sort of replacement by China, but it's another, like I yeah. say, another, another poll out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen anybody seeking to uh, mm -hmm. convert a deal into Chinese currency for products that do not originate in China or end up in China. So that's that's really the gold standard. Which and that moves nicely to your other chapter, economic security. I'm trying to get you to talk about all five parts of the mm -hmm. book here. Um, so in economic security, you talk about the core paradox at the heart of the Gulf political economy. Uh, what are the factors that make the transition? It's, it's, of course, you know, based on hydrocarbons. What are the factors that make the transition out of an oil economy so tricky? And what are some ways the Gulf states can navigate that uh, transition effectively? So one of the key issues is this idea of the, the ruling bargain that has been struck uh, many moons ago between the grandfather's uh, generation uh, in the Gulf, between the leaders uh, and the uh, and the people, uh, instantiating and creating what it is to be a Gulf citizen, and the rights and expectations of Gulf citizens. Um, now, the broad, general sort of cliched story is no representation for no taxation. So, mm -hmm. Gulf citizens pay comparatively little tax, very little tax in reality, and at the same time, they get no uh, no democracy because of that. You know, this is the, 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 the boldest way that it's put. But there is, of course, a, an element of truth there. And there have been for a very long time very significant expectations from citizens of the Gulf as to what the state ought to provide, you know, what, what they deserve from the state in, in terms of jobs for life and these sorts of concerns. Now, people have been writing about th those issues for, for decades. The idea of hidden unemployment in Kuwait in the 60s was, was, was written about, about people who had jobs but never turned up on this kind of an issue. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing new about this. But what we therefore have today is governments looking towards the end of the oil paradigm and looking toward and to trying to transition it into something else, of course. So whereas pearling within very few years, or I'll say a decade or two, switch quite quickly into the oil paradigm. So then that's when the ruling bargain, which was sort of created, it's been around for a very long time, needless to say, it's not a creation of oil, but it was sort of souped up with the significant uh, fiscal power that oil gave the monarchs. And they need to try to transition that into some kind of industry that can re re replicate those sorts of returns in many ways. And of course, one key aspect of the oil bargain is that Gulf citizens have comparatively little to do with the nature of the economy. This is the basis of the rentier state. And so 
when you need to involve your citizens in productive work, it's you're changing the goalposts quite considerably, and it's very difficult to do. And as and when citizen expectations for to pay increasingly for subsidy, uh, excuse me, to pay for um, water, um, electricity, these sorts of things, again, shifting expectations of what a Gulf citizen deserves or whatever the phrase may be, it's just really tricky because you know you can't just create a new industry perhaps the gulf monarchies would like some sort of hydro um, hydrogen industry to sort of replace oil and gas i mean th that will be lovely and delightful but whether that can replace in toto the the hydrocarbons at the moment I'm, I'm not really sure and so one of the key issues is is linking sort of the societal part to the political part to this economic transition mm -hmm. now Perhaps the last thing I'll say here is that, you know, the literature expected a huge amount of difficulty here. I mentioned a lot of societal expectations and the likes, and there is a true element within there. At the same time, in the past decade or so, with our friends in Saudi Arabia, we have seen Saudi citizens, we have been surprised, the literature, as it were, scholars, I think, have been surprised by comparatively how easy Saudi citizens have taken on jobs that previously, you know, it was not assumed that they would take. One yeah. might have assumed beforehand they would want more senior management roles, less customer facing, uh, worse paid jobs in many ways. Mm -hmm. But we've been surprised there. And so it's not set in stone that this is a massive problem, of course, but trying to transition from this you know, I was going to say once a generation, but it's not that. It's once an epoch windfall of mm -hmm. having this insanely important and demanded naturally occurring resource under your feet um, into into a more, quote unquote, normal economy, like many places else in anywhere else in the world. You know, it's, it's a really difficult ask. And unsurprisingly, our friends in the Gulf monarchies are finding it extraordinarily difficult to do the transition, to undertake it. Yeah. Yeah, but but it but it can be done. I mean, you're you're exactly right. I mean, five years ago, uh, Westerners uh, in Saudi Arabia, you know, somebody would burst in and say, "Oh my gosh, you won't believe what I just saw." I'd say, "What?" I say, "I saw a Saudi working in Burger King," and you know, it'd be like saying you saw a zebra walking down the street in New York City, um, and then you'd say, "Well, is he working?" Or, you know, "Well, he's wearing a uniform. He's standing behind the counter." But you know, third country nationals working. But now you see them working. Uh, and, you know, in uh, more so there and perhaps in Oman than some of the other states. But uh, I, I don't think there was any, I can't recall reading any scholarly literature or any of the policy-based literature that predicted this would happen so rapidly mm -hmm. and with so little disruption. So um, let's move on to the political uh domain so you discuss the blockade of Qatar from other gulf countries uh and much of the um, impetus for that or the cited reason for that for the blockade was uh the accusation that doha was causing regional instability uh but in the book you also said that saudi arabia has uh contributed to regional instability as well um which you know sort of indicates this is a part of intra-gulf rivalry how ha has intra-gulf rivalry uh, contributed to regional instability, and how do different Gulf states? They they kind of all agree that there's you know one or two uh, major threats, but then they that's that's about it. The the cooperation is much less than uh, you know Western partners of the Gulf would would hope for. Uh, why is that so? What what is what is the bedeviling mm -hmm. factor here in the security politics? Why is alliance formation so difficult? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, I'm going to bring un Uncle Sam in, in a slightly roundabout kind of a way. And so when it came to the Gulf blockade being the quintessential example of this, so this is, of course, culmination of decades of irritation among other Gulf monarchies with Qatar's actions. And this was ultimately when you know, Bahrain, uh, the UAE, Saudi and Egypt, of course, launches like completely unprecedented blockade of Qatar. And what was so striking about it was that if you listen to the general discourse of the Gulf monarchies over the past number of decades, you know, their central concern might considered to be be considered to be Iran. Uh, 
in many ways and the reaction and the actions of the IRGC near and abroad and the likes and even taken away from their actions I mean you know compared to the compare the Gulf the compare, compare the two sides of the Gulf and you have <clears throat> quintessential quintessentially problematic relations one side is Sunni the other side is Shia one side is a, a Republican sort of contemporary modern, modern Republic the other more conservative monarchies um and and the list kind of go, goes on and and to some degree there are perfectly legitimate reasons to be deeply concerned about iran the missile program houthis hezbollah all these sorts of things and in the middle of you know one of the for a long time we've been concerned about potential nuclear programs in iran of course but if that was your main concern it seems so curious as to how and why the Gulf monarchies would so profoundly distract themselves with this mutually damaging uh, blockade on Qatar. And the ultimate reason, there are a couple of reasons for it. There's one, I think, sort of to do with Gulf politics itself, and it was to do with the nature of Qatar's engagement with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and I think there's an ideological competition in many ways between Qatar, who thinks it is best to have Islamists inside the proverbial tent you know, give them a place in politics so that they do not become more extreme. And the idea, the antithetical idea led by, led by our Emirati friends who think that we absolutely need a Jeffersonian separation. We do not want Islam <coughs> anywhere near uh, the levers of power uh, whatsoever. And so you have two diametrically opposed, ideologically opposed uh, rationales there. And in the Arab Spring, these things were coming to reality in and around the region, of course. And so there's that component too, which is re real and, and, and legitimate, I think, there's, a, there's an irreconcilable difference there. But I think the more general reason is that our friends in the Gulf haven't felt the need to take their own security situation particularly serious for three decades or so, uh, in, a, in a particularly serious manner for three decades or so because I think they misunderstood Uncle Sam would protect them. Since 1990, 1991, uh, as we know, of course, US military bases proliferated around the region. And these were some of the largest and most important US military bases anywhere in many ways, absolutely huge ones, including CENTCOM, of course, in Qatar, you know, where the US military watched over, directed operations for an entire segment of the world. So, I think the Gulf monarchies just got habituated to this idea of Uncle Sam, America is here, there's a presence in the region, and anyway, we've had these difficult relationships for 70 odd years with Uncle Sam. We have paid hundreds of billions of dollars to Uncle Sam for military equipment that mostly we haven't meaningfully used, but we've paid for it. We have paid for this relationship. And so I think there was this kernel of an idea which just never doesn't really stand up to meaningful scrutiny but there was this just this slightly irrational belief in many ways that uncle sam would protect that we can enjoy not enjoy but we can undertake this intra-gulf contretemps against qatar when by far the most concerning issue is iran is just over there but uncle sam is here and uncle sam will protect and I think that's in many ways, you know, one of the key kind of concerns here. Mm -hmm. uh, I call this the protection curse, not the resource curse, but the protection curse in an article I wrote for survival. Uh, and I sort of explain it more in the military section. Um, now, of course, I think this bubble, such as it was, this misunderstood bubble of American Uncle Sam protection, I think that was well and truly burst on the 14th of September. 2019 and that is when a litany a range of uh, drones and cruise missiles attacked with pinpoint accuracy by far the world's largest and most important oil refining facility which is of course in Saudi Arabia in Abqaiq and also a site in at Khores and this evils and problems for our friends in the Gulf monarchies that you know what is the point I mean the, the exact point of decades of difficult relations and very expensive relations with Uncle Sam is precisely to protect our critical national infrastructure when we need it most from precisely this kind of an attack. Mm -hmm. um, and again, 
we don't need to go into the specifics of missile defense and those sorts of things. I feel the sentiment from our friends in the Gulf was, it's just sorted. Uncle, we've paid for it. Uncle Sam's here. We bought some kit. It's it's around somewhere. But the problem is sorted. Um, and this understanding was proven to be wildly out of whack. And I think this is why we've seen, firstly, a more pragmatic Gulf monarchy's engagement with Iran since 2019. And I think this has also spurred on the engagement with China as well um, in the different in, the, in in these various fields. Yeah, yeah, and and you could you could actually uh, expand on that a little bit with the um, the Houthi attacks on UAE. I was talking, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to the Emiratis uh, right, you know, the day of the attacks, and their questions were, well, you know, do you think the United States will um, launch uh, conventional cruise missiles against the Houthis, or will they use a B fifty two? And I was mm-hmm. like, well, I don't think we're going to do anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were just shocked horrifying <laughs> Horrib- yeah yeah it, it, it's very uh interesting we have a question from furkan goldemir wants you to talk about the ongo this builds on this which is why i'm getting on this i don't want to get stuck on security because as you mentioned your your deft illusion that we could talk about missile defense forever and you and i might find it interesting but nobody else would uh, the ongoing arms race among the saudi arabia Qatar, and the uae or if there is in fact an arms race and uh uh, he also implies if you could, see, he thinks that the Saudis have underperformed. Perhaps you can talk about um, why, uh, if if that's true, and if so, why? Sure. So the literature generally looks at sort of the uh, Gulf militaries um, undertaking their activities, and it doesn't com- come to very many positive conclusions, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when you compare the amount of money spent on the equipment, the bang for the buck, if you will seems to be really quite low in many ways. And I, some, in, in some ways, for me, it goes back to this idea of the protection curse, that there is this idea, has been this idea for quite a long time in the Gulf monarchies that, you know, do you really need a particularly effective military? Do you really need, I speak about the, the ruling bargains again, do we need to force our men and increasingly women to undertake arduous, difficult military training for a number of years to put their life on the line for the country. Is is that what we need when we have Uncle Sam? I think that's one component to it. And the other component or the other answer in the literature is to do with the idea of coup proofing. The idea found throughout the world that autocratic leaders often show a desire not to want if to create effective military forces in case the military forces that they create are used against them to topple them. And I think you can see elements of that within the Gulf as well. And so the obvious example here, an obvious uh, cliched um, sort of policy from the coup proofing literature is the creation of a fourth force. So in addition to your traditional army, navy and air force, the ruler might create an entirely separate cadre of forces. And we have this with the Saudi Arabian National Guard. There's this balancing force between Al Sauds or as was between Abdullah and, and the other groups of, of the Al Sauds. And so I think those are a couple of reasons that deeply undercut um, the chance to create effective military forces. Um, I think our Emirati friends, through the creation of the Presidential Guard, have sidestepped a lot of those issues in some ways and found a way to create a new force with a new mandate with new leadership from Australian, incidentally, uh, General Mike Hindmarsh. Um, And he has managed to create a surprisingly effective little force that undertook some, um, achieved some tactical and operational successes in Yemen, if the wider strategic uh, war was a failure for both sides, pretty much. Um, So I think those are a, a couple of key issues there. And as to whether you know, we are seeing or we will see a big change now. I mean, still Saudi Arabia is going through just immense um, procurement uh, with the US and everyone else. I mean, one might assume that Saudi leaders today would look at the performance of Saudi forces in Yemen and the very consistent inability to achieve their operational and strategic ends. Mm -hmm. And they might reflect as to whether there is something they need to do in a fundamentally different way to create effective military forces. Now, 
<clears throat> they have, of course, undertaken a modernization process in the Saudi military. But unless it is, I, I don't know the in, nitty gritty details therein, but unless it is truly a fundamental root and branch change, you know, a history would suggest that it'll, you know, it'll, Saudi forces will still struggle to lever out all that much capability from their, from their acquisitions. Yeah, yeah. Although here's where I have to inject my, my standard point. The more technical a force is, the more it is equipment dependent, uh, mm -hmm. generally the better it is. So, for example, the Saudi Air Defense Forces, which operate surface-to-air missiles, are among the best in the world. And they have mm -hmm. uh, more missile intercepts in combat than any other force in the world. The Emirati Air Defense Forces have, um, uh, they're the only country to have fired THAAD uh in combat and mm. have done it successfully so nazar and, and i i warned you that we could talk about missile defense forever but we're not going to do it that's the end of that uh nazar halal who is a phd candidate in qatar university's gulf center so um bravo to you i think we've both uh, uh spoken there at various times uh, uh asked about soft power which uh, we've been neglecting mm. um the GCC countries have a strong impact on soft power, which includes charitable interests, education, mediation, and has a large domestic influence. And of course, uh, I would broaden that to include the so-called sports diplomacy, which you know you as a Englishman are more familiar with because of soccer. Um, what do you think about this dynamics on the concept of security, both internal and external, in the concept in the context of the GCC governments? It's a good question. I really don't like talking about soft power. Uh, I don't like the concept. Um, I because it speaks to something generally useful, but I struggle like everyone to pin it down. It's you know pinning jelly to a wall, and so I feel that when I speak about this, I end up offering generalities and platitudes mm -hmm. about sport and people wearing PSG shirts, Paris Saint Germain shirts in London and and everywhere else. I mean, so my advice would be to find uh, an organizing principle that, you know, really tries to pin it down. And Joseph Nye has written about measuring soft power. So there is work to, to grapple with there. Um, soft power internally is an interesting thing. I mean, in some ways, speaking of Qatar, you know, one of the sitting back one day thinking about my PhD, my book that looked at kind of Qatari foreign policy and the changes under Hamid bin Khalifa. Um, it did occur to me that, you know, Qatar as a country in its entire history before, I don't know, 1990-ish, had just never, ever been on the world stage in any way, shape or form, um, any meaningful shape or form. In the 80s, it actively hid under the Saudi under Saudi's auspices. Um, and in the 70s, a bit of dinar diplomacy, but not much else. And so what you had with Hamid bin Khalifa and Sheikh Moza and the likes and HBJ and all these sorts of things, these various soft power gambits, you know, a large part, I mean, nothing is monocausal or monodirectional. There's lots of reasons to do all these things. There are economic returns to, to accrue and there's influence abroad and influence domestically to try to gin up. Um, but yeah, speaking to the domestic component, you know, it's maybe not focused on quite as much. I just think when Qatar affected a temporarily successful ceasefire, and I want to say 2008 in Lebanon, where they flew everyone to the Sheraton and the likes. Mm -hmm. And I remember they were, Hagen Daz in uh, Beirut uh, created an ice cream um, in some way, shape, or form, sort of speaking to this, like, thank you, Qatar ice cream, or something like this. And there were banners of, of Sheikh Hamoza and, and Hamid in, in Beirut at the time. I just thought that that's the first time ever that's kind of happened. And so the reflection on that among Qatari society of their leader putting their state on the world in, in this world leading capacity, how you measure that is a really tricky thing. Or maybe Cessary have some data on it or something, but it is part of it. But just it's just the measurement is just, you know, it's it's just tricky, uh, tricky to chat about, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've always said soft power is power that exists, but it cannot be used to achieve a specific policy aim. <laughs> and uh, so, so maybe maybe it's not really power so much as a shared vocabulary or a, a shared uh, 
way of dealing with things. Well, we're, we're running out of, this has been a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, point. So let me once again point out the book. It's published by Columbia University Press, Security, Politics, and the Gulf Monarchy, uh, Continuity and Change. Um, it is uh, uh, referred to and endorsed by uh, all of the leading uh, Gulf scholars. Um, you'll find uh, the bibliography and the notes are, are worth the price of purchase alone. Um, I want to go to the uh, issue of the environment. We spoke briefly about it, but we're dealing with a, a, a place that first off is seen as one of the main sources of what's leading to global climate change and the instability. We've got large modern cities that uh, had not do not exist without an extreme investment in energy and a lot of more money than elsewhere. Uh, and we also have uh, we're seeing a lot of you know things like Mustar, the uh, alternate energy city in Abu Dhabi. Um, the possibility there seems to be a lot of research on this. Is this something that you think uh, the Gulf states will be able to either? import another solution from or are they true thought leaders in this field of dealing with it or is this just sort of trying to put a, a brave face on what really is a global project a problem that is beyond everybody's wish uh, everybody's ability sure so natalie koch has written quite a bit on this and she came up with a wonderful phrase she talked about uh, in the gulf there's a long evident uh, desire for a techno fetishistic solution to, to any given problem and you see this going back with the Brits 100 years ago. So a Brit, uh, one of the British advisors in Kuwait, uh, got a lot of money and he had this machine where you would push a sheep in at one end and hot mutton sandwiches would come out at the other end. And, you know, <laughs> funnily enough, it didn't work. But it was about this hyper-modern solution to, to a problem or in the environmental context to a wicked problem. And again, in the early 20th century, you see this all the time about trying to import solutions to overcome arid climates, climate issues and stuff. And we now we have hydroponics uh, and the likes. Uh, we have Mazda and so on. And so we have the latest version of the techno fetishistic solution, the one stop solution to a much broader wicked problem. Um, if past is anything like prologue, then no, we can't even be slightly persuaded that um, the proposed quote unquote solutions in play are going to work. Um, it's very difficult to see a lot of these initiatives as much more than greenwash, to be honest. Um, because I, I just don't see, I'm open to being corrected on this or any of on, on these other points. I mean, I just don't see the environment registering in a meaningful way on Gulf societies and leadership as a critical problem. Um, and therefore, without a, a belief that it's a problem, I don't see how you can begin to fashion some kind of solution, to be honest. Mm. Well, that's a depressing note to end our discussion on. Uh, mm. Once again, the speaker, David Roberts, Continuity, uh, uh, Security Politics in the Gulf Monarchies, Continuity Against Change, published by the Columbia University Press. Uh, it just came out last month. Um, uh, it's one of a, there's sort of a wave of four volumes that I know of that have come out in English on Gulf security. There's David Roberts. There's an edited volume uh, edited by Robert Springborg. Uh, there is um, a series of case studies of U.S. security uh, assistance building in the Middle East, uh, also the Gulf by Bilal Saab. And then there is a comprehensive book written by Jean-Luc Saman. So um, all four of these books are um, uh, currently duking it out, but this is the one First off, it's the only uh, book length study, not case studies. And it, again, it's organized about um, theories. Uh, the Copenhagen School of International Relations, which posits that there's different types of security, uh, military, political, economic, social, uh, environmental, and uh, studies the entire Gulf region in terms of each one of those. So each of these five chapters can be read as standalone uh, studies uh, quite productively, and again, uh, the uh, resourcing, the, the research, and the sourcing is immaculate. So, with that, David, we've got one minute for you to say goodbye and leave us with a point uh, on it. Oh goodness! Uh, well, thank you all for turning up. I know there's plenty of other ways everyone could be spending their time, so I appreciate that. And to Professor Darash, um, the Gulf monarchies have undertaken tremendous transitions before. Um, they have 
you know, $1.3 trillion extra in their pockets as of about the last two years, 18 months, according to the FT or the IMF. And so there's the cash there. If they truly grasp the scale of the hill they're facing, then hopefully they can spend it wisely. And so, you know, it's incredibly difficult, but 1.3 trillion will get you quite a long way. So um, good luck to them. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Once again, on behalf of the Gulf International Forum, um, please check our website, uh, GIF org, uh, G Gulf International Forum website. Please check that out. We have a, a standard uh, a schedule of events uh, on a weekly basis, and there's always publications coming out. This is a, a wonderful thing. And once again, on behalf of the Gulf International Forum, Thank you to Dr. Roberts. Thank you for asking questions. And thank you for the listeners. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you.